Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I'm Kathy Murphy from the Iowa Bicycle Coalition, and I'd like to welcome you to our third webinar, webinar in a series of four about bike commuting. If you're curious about riding your bike to work instead of driving, you are at the right place. Our focus today is on the types of accessories most commuters depend on when they commute. We have three experts with us today who will be sharing their thoughts and experiences about bike accessories. So we've drawn upon the collective expertise of the members of the Iowa Bike Coalition to give you the best advice possible. We asked them to take one of our surveys and they have shared their experiences to give you ideas about what works for bicycle commuting. Keep in mind that the tips provided in this ebook and this webinar are only suggestions. You may not need to buy a new bike or new gear to start riding your work. Much of the gear you need, you will likely already have. Iowa bike commuter Carrie S., who's a three-mile commuter, said, don't build up a false barrier in your mind to bike commuting. It's accessible as you want it to be. Most of all, remember to have fun. So this ebook and this webinar is made possible by the members and supporters of the Iowa Bicycle Coalition. This organization is a grassroots movement of bicyclists from across Iowa to make bicycling safe and accessible for all. For all. Our mission at the Iowa Bicycle Coalition is to promote safe and enjoyable bicycling in Iowa through education, events, better policy, and a growing of community of supporters. You can join us. You see on the screen there, iowabicyclecoalition.org backslash join. So how about meeting our experts? First off, we have Aaron Weiner. And Aaron, if you want to uh, say hello and give us a quick synopsis of who you are and uh, how you bike commute. Sure thing. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Aaron. Um, I've been commuting by bike for about 10 years. Uh, I work in Iowa City at World of Bikes. Um, so, you know, obviously that gives me access to everything that I could possibly need, which is great. Um, I first started commuting while I was living in Chicago um, and getting around with a bike and on the train was a lot more convenient than actually having a car. So I ended up getting rid of the car that I had then and I've been commuting just by bicycle or public transportation ever since. Nice. And I'm assuming that you wash your bike occasionally based on the photo we see here. You know, I, I just think it looks better with mud on it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, that's true. Well, thank you, Aaron. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And then we have Trevor Bridges. Hi, Trevor. Hello, how's it going? Good. I uh, I uh, I guess I've been commuting by bike for not quite as long as Aaron, probably about six or seven years. Um, I started when I lived in Las Vegas, uh, just to kind of get ready for some. I, when I lived there, I'd come back to visit Iowa, where I grew up, and would do ragbri and just trying to get in shape for that, and then it just kind of turned into something fun to do and an easy way to get back and forth. Excellent. And where do you work? I work at uh, Bike Tech in Cedar Falls, Iowa. So uh, once again, plenty of uh, plenty of stuff to stock up on where I'm at. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome to our webinar. Thank you. And then finally, we have Alan Moran. Hi, Alan. Hi, uh, I am the uh, lead of the internal audit function at CRST International, so I've been bicycle commuting on and off for about five or six years now. Um, it started off as a way to get into shape uh, and get healthy, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, benefits. So if you, uh, anybody out there listening has any issues with anxiety or depression, it's also very beneficial to uh, taking proactive treatments towards those. So. Um, it's been really helpful with that, uh, but I do it now just because it's an easy way to get my my exercise in, uh, you know, 10 miles one way, and then I take the long way home, so I get 20 or 30 miles in a day, and just try and keep my uh, keep my optimism up. That's a great commute. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Alan. So, why commute by bicycle in Iowa? Uh, Alan just mentioned a great uh, benefit as far as health benefits. There's also, of course, environmental benefits and economic benefits. Um, we all know there's many reasons beyond this to commute 
to work by bicycle, um, enhanced health, saving the environment, saving money, but the greatest appeal of bicycle commuting is simply that it's fun, and I think all of our experts can say that it's fun. We keep hearing that over and over and over again. It's just an enjoyable way to start and end your workday. As far as health benefits go, uh, I mentioned this last week, but it's worth repeating. A 2011 study from the University of Northern Iowa highlighted Iowa bicyclists enjoy more than a $70 million savings in health cost. And keep in mind, that's just Iowa bicyclists. Um, and of course, one of our survey takers said, you'll feel so much better physically and emotionally. And Alan just uh, highlighted that as well. As far as environmental benefits, there are increasing awareness and concerns about climate, demand for energy, loss of natural habitat, health issues related to air quality, and challenges with water provision. And the bicycle is the most energy efficient personal transportation device ever created. That's a pretty bold statement, but it's also very true. Most energy efficient personal transportation device ever created. And one of our commuters who commutes three miles a day, Kim, said she wished she knew before she started bike commuting how much easier it is than driving to work and worrying about parking. And then, of course, you've got the economic benefits. People are struggling to cope with the economic challenges of housing, food, health care, and transportation. Bicycles are an affordable solution. A quality bicycle can be bought for the cost of about one car payment, will never need fueling, and is cheaply repaired. So I'm assuming that I can say this for myself and our experts probably too. Um, we probably all have more than one bicycle and we've probably spent a little bit more money than um, is needed, but just to know that bicycles are affordable. Um, one survey taker said, as far as commuting, the biggest barrier is just getting started. Talk to other riders and leverage their experience. So, types of accessories that you need when you ride a bike. In our Bike to Work survey, Iowa bike commuters say they depend on the following items for every commute. 60% of our survey takers said they have lights on their bike. 59% of survey takers always have a water bottle with them. 55% of survey takers say they have a lock. And 45% of our survey takers include a spare tire, tools, and a flat kit on every single commute. So let's dig a little deeper into these categories. As far as lighting goes, lights not only help cyclists see the road in darkness and bad weather, but they also help drivers on the road see the cyclists. So let's shoot over to Trevor. Can you maybe give us some highlights of the variety of headlights out there? Um, they come in many different forms, uh, usually varied on a, a lumen, is a, pretty much a measurement of light power, like kind of like candle power or a, a wattage in your house lights. Um, either mount them on your bike or on a helmet, you know, higher visibility, and also have many settings, you know, high, medium, low, plus also a, a strobe setting. I hope it works really well with, like, the uh, at dusk, you know, where there's still a light out, but you need some more attention and visibility for just your safety. All right, thank you. And then how about Aaron? Um, tail lights. Give us some ideas on a variety of tail lights. Sure. Uh, there are a lot of taillights available these days, just like there are headlights. And uh, legally speaking, in Iowa, you're only required to have a rear reflector. But I never send anybody out the door at the shop with a new bike without at least reminding them that a taillight is a good idea. Um, really, any sort of red blinking light that's going to get you seen and indicate that it's your, your back end people are looking at in the dark uh, will do the trick. We're seeing more and more options for lights that are rated to be daylight visible. Um, and I've personally found, for whatever reason, when I have one of those on, even during the day, cars give me a little more clearance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like they couldn't see me before, but, you know, they're, uh, they're going to give me a couple more feet, which I always prefer. Um, and you can get them, you know, battery-powered. You can get them uh, USB rechargeable, which seems to be the, the most popular thing right now. And then there are options you can hook up to uh, dynamo hubs that generate electricity through uh, what I like to call hamster power, or just the motion of the bike as, it, as it's rolling down the street. 
Right, and one of my bikes, the touring bike that I have, is hub generated. So the lights are permanently affixed to my bike, and as I pedal, they turn on um, both rear and front lights. But uh, most of the lighting system that I use on my other bikes um, are also removable. So when you're biking to work, and let's say you have to lock up outside somewhere, typically um, lights can be removed, um, you know, especially if you are going to recharge them during your work day. Which brings us to Alan. Um, some lights have batteries, some lights have rechargeable. Do you have any insight or experience on what's better? Well, so, I mean, the nice thing about the battery-powered lights is it's pretty easy to swap them. You can hot swap them on your ride if you've got a set of double A's to change them out. Um, in my experience, the, you know, a tail light with a set of double A's in there is going to last you a good long while, or AAA is going to last you a good long while. The problem I've run into with, with AA or AAA battery headlights is they just consume so much power that the cost savings for these less expensive headlights quickly get overcome just by the cost of replacing the batteries all the time. Uh -huh. um, and there's less quality options out there, at least in my experience, for the replaceable battery versions of headlights. Um, so in my opinion, you're better off going with a rechargeable headlight. And like was mentioned earlier, a lot of them can be recharged from USB cables. So if you're concerned about how much power you have left on that bike, it's really easy to just carry a spare backup battery charger in your pocket that you can plug the headlight into. Um, a lot of them will even run off of that auxiliary battery power. Um, and again, over the life of the bike, you tend to have better output on those and you know, l less cost of running the headlight in the long run. Um, if you've got the money for a Dynamo headlight, those are really, really great, uh, but you are looking at significantly higher of an investment to, you know, you have to have a wheel built with the generator in there, and then the headlights also tend to be a little more expensive as well. Very good point. And one of our survey takers mentioned um, she didn't know it when she started, but now she says, I would have spent a little more money on better lights. And that's exactly to, Aaron, to Alan's point that um, in the long run, sometimes spending a little more on a rechargeable that you can charge up day in and day out, not worry about batteries, um, can make a difference in the long run. Uh, moving on to hydration, um, I would guess the majority of bikes have, um, maybe the bike shop guys can jump in here, but most bikes have the availability to put a bottle cage on the frame. Um, if not, I know there are types of cages that do not require um, screw-in options, but um, Alan, give us some options on how to transport water on your commute. All right. So, I mean, the, the easiest way is just if you have water bottle cages, throw them in there and, uh, you know, you're off on your way. Uh, there are also some options for me personally. I like to have a cup of coffee on my morning commute. So I managed to find a, uh, a coffee cup uh, by oh, Contigo that will actually fit in a water bottle cage so I can have a cup of coffee on my morning commute. Uh, if you have bags, you can keep spare water in there, but unless your commute's typical or particularly long, you probably don't need you know all that surplus water. Um, and another option is a camelback. And for mountain biking, I think camelbacks are really good because they prevent you from losing your bottles on the trail. But for me personally, anything you can do to reduce weight on your back and weight into the saddle is really going to help the quality of your commute. So if you have water bottle cages for your morning commute, that's sort of the way I'd push you. Um, another thing worth considering is you can buy a lot of, you know, water bottles for just a few dollars. But when it starts to get a little warmer, in my opinion, it's worth spending a little bit of extra money to buy an insulated uh like a polar bottle, something like that, just because the water will be a little cooler and a little more refreshing for you to drink. Definitely. Moving on to tools and repair equipment. Um, most bicyclists, you know, cannot expect to carry all the bike repair tools that you may see at a bike shop, but there are some pretty cool uh, small pieces of equipment that you can put into a under your seat bike bag or in your backpack that may uh, save you for ro on roadside repairs. So Trevor, can you give us an idea um, what a multi-tool is? Uh, a multi-tool is, you know, like the Gerber or Leatherman, but specified, you know, fold-out keys or whatever. It's like the Swiss Army knife that has all the 
uh, sizes of wrenches that you need to specifically work on a bike. Most of them are going to be uh, a hex key or sometimes a screwdriver and even have something if you need to fix a chain or something like that. Um, being a mechanic, I know how to adjust almost everything on a bike. I tend to pack pretty heavy for that just-in-case moment, which can be a, a pain, but some of them, they really do fold down into, you know, uh, a, a, a small type, uh, compact space. Um, some, some extra bags that you have have like little compartments to hold those tools. Um, but you can buy the tool, but I think the most important part is, you know, knowing how to use that tool. Um, there's a lot of bike shops that give, uh, classes, you know, basic classes or even open their doors after hours to do a park tool school or, something to that effect where it's just a, you know, couple hours, one night a week and, and sometimes in the fall that, you know, our shop does. But, uh, or there's certain bike collectives in town, they, they jump in, volunteer some time, you help them out and they help you how to work on your bike. So you gain some knowledge that way. Um, any knowledge learning how to work on a bike and care for it is typically invaluable. You know, you make it to work on time, plus, you know, you, you may get strained somewhere and that can probably be a really big problem depending on where you're at. Right. And I think, you know, one of the simplest things that I use my multi-tool for is adjusting my saddle. Um, Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, moving it up, moving it down, moving it forward a little bit. Um, You know, if I wear different shoes, sometimes just a small adjustment makes your bike ride a lot easier. And it's something that you could not do without uh, having the right tool. So, and I agree that those multi-tools, they can fold up into each other very small. Um, you, can, you can usually find a little teeny compartment in your backpack or your, uh, some sort of bag that may be attached to your bike that you can carry it. Mm-hmm. So then moving over to Aaron, um, uh, people may or may not know what a tire lever, lever is. So maybe if you could briefly tell us what that is and then sure. um, what a flat kit might contain. Sure. Um, so a tire lever is the tool that you use to get the tire on and off of the rim. Uh, the, there's a little hook on there kind of on the, uh, on the inside that catches the edge of the tire and holds it tight in there. And obviously if you're going to change a flat, you need to be able to get in there and, and work on the tube. So tire levers come in a lot of different materials. They're plastic ones, they're titanium ones, they're whatever you can think of. And wood would be kind of foolish, but I'm sure somebody's done it. Um, They typically have a little scoop on one side that you use to pry off the tire and a little hook on the other that you can use to uh, uh, keep the tire lever stationary by positioning it around a spoke if you got a particularly difficult one. They typically come in sets of two or three, so you can kind of do that, leave one in, and then work your way around the side with another. Um, But once you're used to changing a tire, typically one is going to be enough. so you you keep those on you because when you get a flat, it's that tube on the inside you need to work on. Um, typically not the tire itself. That's going to be a little bit of a bigger problem if something's gone wrong there. Um, and so in your flat kit, the, the things that I always advise people to have are uh, a tube. Obviously, the appropriate size and valve type is necessary. If you have questions about that, check out your local bike shop, and they'll be able to point you in the right direction. Um, a patch kit, which um, usually I don't, it's not the first thing I go for if I've already used my spare tube. Um, then I might break out the patch kit to patch a hole in that. Um, so that's it's a good thing to have, but definitely for you know, re- repeat flats if you're having that problem. Um, and then, you know, having a multi-tool there is, is always key. And you can fit those things in a, a seat bag really easily. Um, everything comes uh, pretty packable. Um, or you can even do stuff like I, I know a couple people, myself included, who will use an old water bottle stuffed full of that that stuff um, and put into a an extra water bottle cage that you're not using for water. Oh, that's a good tip. Great. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, I, I have a few comments on this, but let's, like, Alan, for example, what do you carry on your bike as far as tools? Um, 
for me, the, the multi-tool, a lot of them will actually have the tire lever built into them, and it's not quite as convenient as using two tire levers, but it'll do a pretty good job of getting the wheel off because the number one breakdown you're going to run into as a cyclist is, is flat tires. So having either a patch kit or a placement tube, and then I like to carry an air truck, so that's a little CO2-powered uh, tire inflator. Uh, just so you can replace the tire, get it inflated really quick, and get on your way. At a bare minimum, I would carry this stuff to have that, you know, ability to repair your tire on the road. Um, when you start getting beyond that, you're looking at maybe tightening loose parts, but if you have problems with spokes or chains, you know, make sure you understand how to correct those down the road. Um, so, like, yeah, I guess the, the bike tool, uh, something to repair the tires, be that a flat or a patch kit, and then uh, an air chuck to fill the air, or bicycle pump if you have more, you know, carrying capacity on your bicycle. Right. And uh, patch kits can come pretty small. Um, they can be as small as, like, a circular, like, almost like a little teeny lip balm container that will fit everything you need for a patch kit. Um, with the exception of a pump, you have to have a way to put air back in the tire. Um, and you, somebody asked a question about, you know, how do you, can you go to YouTube and find out how to uh, change a tire? Yes, you can. It's really simple. Just Google, how do I change a flat tire? And you'll get actual tutorials on it. Um, but a couple of our survey takers mentioned, like it says here, know how to fix a flat. But if you don't know how to fix a flat, at least have a flat repair kit on your bike. So if a good Samaritan comes along and you're struggling to figure out how to get your tube off or how to get your tire removed, um, hopefully someone can help you if you have the parts with you. Yep. And, and one thing I'll say too about the patch kits is there's two basic kinds you can get. Uh, one is just a sticker that will adhere to the outside of the tube and the other one is a, I believe it's called a self-galvanizing patch kit. And it's, I've had a lot better luck with the galvanizing patch kits than the stickers. And Trevor and Aaron, you can speak up if you've had luck with the, uh, the sticker patches. Um, but those just do, in my experience, a much better job of creating a really good seal on that tube when you're repairing it. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Definitely. Okay, well, speaking of uh, that tube, um, if, you're, if you really have never really looked at your tires and tubes that, you know, make you make your bike propel, there are different types of valves. So let's get into a little bit, you know, there's two pictures here on your screen. Um, Trevor, tell us what the difference is between Presta, Presta or Schrader valves. Um, it's probably a big argument which one's better, um, chicken or the egg, who knows. But uh, it's really their, their function is the same. Not one is really better than the other. Um, just a different design and a way to put air in a tire. Um, one is more familiar to more people. The, the Schrader is a little bit bigger, standard that's on almost every car. Um, the Presta one is a, the skinny one that has a little check valve in it. Um, rumor is, you know, the the smaller one just took more less material out of a rim, um, so the rim could, could be a little bit stronger. Um, both of them work great. It just kind of depends on which which one your rim is designed for and um just kind of match it with what what you've already what the bike came with um sometimes you can change one from the other but that's kind of opening a can of worms sometimes so um for lack of a better word they're both of them work great um just make sure you know which one you have and and how to inflate it um properly if any questions you know find your local uh, bike genius or stop by the bike shop um, that you have nearby, and most everybody would be glad to help you out with them. And I think um, I'm going to go to Aaron because you brought up a couple good points, Trevor. So let's say that I have, you know, the Presta valve on my bike and I have a flat tire. Um, if I want to be prepared for that, how do I know what kind of hand pump to have on my bike? Or if I do uh, what Alan mentioned, you know, compressed air, how do I know which equip if I have the right equipment? So almost anybody at your local bike shop will be able to point you in the right direction. Um, almost all modern pumps can handle either style. 
especially if we're talking about floor pumps, the big bulky ones you might keep at home and they usually have a gauge on them. Um, but that's not something you're going to have with you. So right. some of the some of the smaller hand pumps you can take with you that are really lightweight and everything are specific to a type of valve. And usually they'll have a picture of that type of valve on the packaging or someone in your local bike shop can point you towards the right one. Um, the one thing to consider when you're picking out a pump or something like that uh, is what pressures it's designed to get a tire to. Some of them move more air more quickly, but they can't get a bicycle tire up to, say, the pressure that a road bike tire would want to be at. So you got to make sure that you've got the right pump for your tire. And it'll say on the side of your tire what pressure range is ideal for that particular tire. So that's something to be aware of. Most of the, that equipment is super lightweight. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about the CO2 chucks. That's going to be the lightest weight option. But it can be a little uh, awkward. Um, I've personally screwed up filling up a tire with CO2 more times than I can count. So at this point, I just carry a hand pump. But and once you're used to it, once you've practiced, it's an effective way to fill up a tire too. And with those uh, CO2 cartridges, it's one and done, right? Once you use it, it is now yep. trash. So that's yeah, when you one... want to have that hand pump as a backup. Mm-hmm. Okay, definitely. Yeah, exactly. So, Alan, we may have uh, hit on this a little bit, but um, when somebody's commuting to work, how do they know if they have enough air in their tires? I, I think, so I check my tire pressure every morning before I go out, and it depends on what kind of bike you have. So, you know, I've got a fat bike that runs as low as 10 PSI versus my road bike, which I have to run at 120 PSI. So, you know, it, it's really important to know what kind of tires you have and what the PSI recommended recommended ratings on those tires are. Um, and even beyond just those flat numbers that are going to be on those tires, depending on what you have, you may be able to go out to their website and say, I weigh this many pounds, how much air pressure should I be running in these tires? So while my wife and I have the same you know, tires on our road bikes, she runs hers at considerably less air pressure. So I commute on, on much bigger tires that run on lower pressure, and if you can do that, it's going to give you a more comfortable ride for commuting. But I think more than anything, it's really critical to understand, you know, what are these tires designed to run at, and then am I running them at that? Because there's a real temptation to run it at less pressure to have a more comfortable ride. But if you run too low, you're going to get what's called a snake bite where you, you know, pinch the tire between the road and your bike frame, and then, you know, you've got a flat on your hands. Uh -huh. um, so understanding what the tires are built for, what kind of road you're going to be riding them over, and then, you know, again, check them every time because the number of times I've gone out to my bike, you know, my road bike in particular loses a lot of its air uh, overnight sometimes. You can go from 120 when I'm putting it away in the evening down to 100 PSI when I go to get it the next morning, and that's not enough tire pressure. I'm going to get a flat on that. Okay. And you can, when you look at your actual tire, um, you can see what the manufacturer recommendations are as far as how much air to put in the tires. Yep. And, and to that, like, you know, I kind of alluded to this as well. It will generally give you a range, and pretty typically with a lot of tires, the heavier a rider you are, the more on the upper end of that recommended PSI rating you're going to want to be. Okay. All right. Fender. So, Riding in the rain or the muck or the snow, it doesn't have to be miserable, uh, provided you have fenders. Um, Trevor, give us a, a quick highlight of the types of fenders available. Um, basically, fenders are, you know, an amazing accessory. You know, they're just so, so completely simple. Uh, some work better than others, depending on what you want to do. Uh, there's your full coverage, you know, that cover at least like three quarters of the circumference of the wheel. Um, and then there's like a snap-on quick type that look kind of like, you know, motocross fenders. Um, ones, the, the full coverage ones are a little more intricate to install or remove if you want to switch back and forth on them to have them on. Um, plastic snap-on ones are easy if you just poke your head out the window and it's raining, quick throw them on. Uh, both of them work great. Uh, just uh, whatever your preference and sometimes, you know, looks and the aesthetic are really important. So, uh, Full coverage fenders look pretty cool. Snap-on fenders, you know, do their thing too. So it's kind of a personal preference, really. Sure, sure. 
And you know the, the, the benefits seem pretty obvious, but Alan, can you give us some insight on what you think fender benefits are? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's it's splash protection. Um, I, all of the bikes I use for commuting into the office with, I, I have fenders on because even though I'm going to change, it's nice to not have. You know, you run through a puddle and you don't have to worry about getting a skunk tail uh, running up your back, and it helps to just keep you dry. Definitely. And most fenders are pretty affordable, um, as it's mentioned here. Okay, so we got to keep this bike locked up while we're at work. Um, a strong bike lock is necessary whenever you plan to leave your bike unguarded. Um, there's no such thing as a completely unbreakable lock, at least to my knowledge, um, but some locks are clearly better than others, and the best locks can provide a reasonable surety that your bike will not get stolen. Um, Aaron, give us some ideas of some popular bike types, bike sure. lock types. Sure. Um, the most popular is just going to be your standard cable lock, um, at least in uh, in Iowa City where I am. Um, we have a lot of students who are riding them to class and things like that. They're pretty lightweight. They're easy to use. You can get them through the front tire and the frame, as well as around whatever you're locking to. Um, the the most secure, at least uh, you know, in most people's eyes, my, mine included, uh, is going to be the U lock, um, and you can see one of those in the picture that's up on the slide there. Um, it's, you know, U shaped uh, piece of metal that you just clamp the bike frame to something with. The only drawback there is that it can be a little bit tough to get it uh, around a wheel, um, or you know, impossible to get it around both. Uh, what I did when I was commuting in Chicago, where bike theft was a, a pretty huge problem, um, was I used a U-lock with the addition of kind of a steel strap that I could run through both wheels and attach to the U-lock. Uh, that, yeah, I never had anything stolen. Um, you do run into people who will walk off with just one wheel to go scrap it or something or, you know, swap onto one of their bikes. So it's a good idea to keep that locked up, especially if you're leaving the bike somewhere overnight. Um, there are a lot of other styles of locks these days. I have one that I use around town that's almost like a, a zip tie with a combination on it. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, just your standard the chain in a bag is uh, what I usually call it. Um, and you can buy those pretty much anywhere, heavy duty, light duty, and they're pretty easy to use. Um, so that's that's a favorite of mine these days as well. Um, well, Trevor, when you, you know, we've been talking about uh, quite, uh, quite a few different lock types, but um, give us some highlights on how to properly lock your bike so that, like Aaron said, you know, your front tire doesn't disappear. Well, yeah, like you said, uh, you want to string, string your lock through as many parts of the bike as you can, most importantly through the frame. Also, you know, obviously pay attention to what you're tying it to so they can't just lift your bike over the post that you tie to. But, uh, yeah. Any way you can secure all the items, there's ways to um, they make different uh, axles that you can have a special keyed way to unlock so you can't just quick release and undo it and steal a wheel, which is a good way to secure your wheels a little bit better. Um, but anything from going the full nine to, like, the U-lock or, you know, if I'm just running to a gas station real quick, I just put it shifted into the highest gear possible so you can't take off really quickly, and I strap my helmet, you know, through the frame and through the rear wheel. So just one more pain in the butt for someone if they do try to take off with it. And hopefully, it, you know, it's harder to take away real quick. Um, so, you know, whether it's just the simple measures of that or, you know, full-on log chain and, and a padlock. But, yeah, tie, tie it through as many items on the bike as you can and make it less convenient. I love that tip uh, if you're just going in somewhere quick to put it in the highest gear because you definitely would slow somebody down if they were mm – -hmm going to get on it and start pedaling. So that's a great tip. Uh, we also had one of our survey takers say, if you commute often, like if you're a daily commuter going to the same spot every day to lock up your bike, um, leave a like, leave the lock attached to the rack where you park. So then it's waiting there for you, especially if it's something that maybe is a little bit heavier and you don't want to carry it every day. So I thought that was a great tip uh, to share with you. So as far as... Um, uh, getting together with all the accessories, I think we have um, gotten through about all the accessory one we want to talk about. And hopefully today's webinar helped you with great commuting ideas from our experts. For more info, be sure to download our free ebook, 
stop by your local bike shop and ask fellow coworkers who commute. So I'd like to thank our experts, Trevor, Aaron, and Alan, for joining us today. I uh, loved your tips and your experiences that you shared. And hopefully tune in next week for another bike commuting webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.